You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Jay Novella. Hey, guys. And Andrea Jones-Roy. Andrea, welcome back to the SGU. Thank you. It's always lovely to be here. Uh, hi hi to all the novellas and novella yeah, just fans. You yeah, you and the novella boys. <laughs> I'm just invading a family reunion at this point. Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, Evan, we had to record on Tuesday because we're going to, to Dallas later in the week to for the Eclipse Weekend thing. Kara's working tonight. She's like, like I think literally working impatient. Wow. Evan is tax season. Tax season right. madness. Work until midnight every night. Yeah. And he got to do extra work because he still had to carve out time for the eclipse, even though it was like yeah. worst possible time of the year. So it's, you, you just have us tonight, uh, Andrea. I'll be playing the role of Evan and Kara at various points. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been practicing my impressions. Remember so. back in like the 80s and 90s, it's a very special episode of Blossom. Remember they used to say shit like that? <laughs> Blossom is a deep cut. Well done. Oh, yeah. It's a deep cut. All right. Andrew, tell me something. Okay. How is my butcher knife in your kitchen doing? <laughs> it's doing just fine. It's, uh, it's missing its glory days of being on stage at Nauticon. <laughs> and uh, it, is, it is resigned currently to its sad fate of resting in a drawer, which is very depressing for everybody. I haven't... No, I don't like that at all. If it's not on the wall, I'm no. not happy. I keep, I keep making the excuse, oh, we moved recently, so I, I haven't mounted it on the wall. We moved in May, which is nearly a year ago, but I just haven't found the time somehow to, uh, <laughs> to mount them to the wall. So, so the butcher knife and, and all its friends are, are sadly nestled away. They're, I like to think of them as hibernating until uh, their next time to shine. But uh, yeah. Well, you don't eat a lot of meat, so I guess you don't really need it. I really, the, the Nauticon cooking show is, is probably the most use it ever got in its life. <laughs> and I've had it for like seven years. <laughs> We, we opened a coconut with it once, and otherwise, I think I might put googly eyes on it for fun at some point. <laughs> Speaking of coconuts, I don't know if I ever told you guys this. Did I tell you that when I went to Hawaii, that one of the places that we, we, you know, we rented Airbnbs, right? One of the houses had a coconut tree, and I ate two coconuts off the tree that I pulled down myself. Hmm. Did I tell you this? No. No. Yeah, like I had to get the, you know, the outer, what would you call that? On the the husk. It's the husk. Outer husk. Yeah. That was not freaking easy at yeah, all. Yeah, right? I'm thinking like, did I burn more calories ripping this thing apart than I would get from eating the coconut, you know? Yeah. If you saw a survivor, you'd know, you'd know that. <laughs> but what I did was I roasted it. I made roasted coconut and it was freaking amazing. Like you roasted wow. the meat that was on the inside? Yeah, yeah. I took it out. I put it, I, you know, I, I broke it into very, very small pieces and then I roasted it in a pan and it was like really, really flavorful, like awesome. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Speaking of coconut, I went to Alaska last week. Wow. That's why I wasn't on the show. I was visiting my daughter, Ashley, and her boyfriend, Cormac, in Girdwood, Alaska. Alaska is amazing. It is so beautiful. Ashley works at the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. Wow. And she, she is amazing. She takes care of bears, foxes, bison, eagles, and, of course, as we all know in the family, Twix the porcupine. <laughs> um, such an adorable porcupine. But it's, a, it's an amazing place. And... Alaska is even more beautiful than I anticipated because when you're driving around in this time of year, there's, it's snow-capped mountains everywhere you look, and it's mind-boggling how beautiful it was. I came home back home to Connecticut, and I'm driving around, and I'm like, something is missing. Uh. This place looks <laughs> horrible because you look at the horizon. It's like, I don't see anything, maybe tiny hills, but it was such – oh, man, I can't even imagine living there. Where in Alaska is Gerwick, you said? Ger Girdwood. 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 I wasn't even close. Where yeah. in Alaska is that? It's a, it's about forty five minutes from Anchorage. Okay. The other striking thing, of course, when you go there, and this will be no surprise, is that there's so much snow everywhere. Oh, it's it's crazy. like it's like snow used to be when you know mm. thirty years ago before climate change really kicked in in Connecticut anyway. It's just like so much snow. They would get like, oh yeah, we got three feet of snow two weeks ago. Like what? Three feet? And it's not even like news probably for them. No. Oh, it's nothing. They're just like whatever. You know, wow. they just. Nothing I, for them, but just a huge accumulation of snow that I haven't seen in so long because it's just like doesn't really snow much anymore in the Northeast. Yeah. No, because I'm in New York, in New York City, and I, I've forgotten what it's like to have more than a dusting of snow. Yeah. And that's uh, now I'm depressed. You're right. Yeah. yeah. I forgot about that. So thank you, Ashley and Cormac, for an amazing time in Alaska. Can't I don't miss the snow. 
Oh, I do. I love the snow. <laughs> Steve is pro climate change. <laughs> I, I, mean, I do jokingly say that all the time. Thank God for climate change. You yeah, know, you have the, we have a nice weather. I mean, it's been it has been literally years since we've had a harsh winter. Yeah, you know, I remember yeah. what, 10, 12 years ago was like the last really bad winter where snow was piled up ten feet on the side yeah. of the road. Yeah, like, they had to come in with back hose because they couldn't even plow it anymore. You know, we were, I was snowed in my house for three days. Like, yeah. A friend of mine yeah. is from Buffalo, and he was there when they got snowed in last year or the year before. And that was the first time I recalled that we would have like snow days where you truly couldn't leave the house because I've just gotten so used to being like, oh, it's snowing. It's like slightly more complicated than rain. And that's sort of all I think about at this point. All right, Alaska, it is. I'll see you there. Yeah, I've been wanting, my wife and I were going to go, but the thing that Bob didn't say, it's really expensive to go there. Is it? Well, depending where you're coming from, but yeah, it's across the country. Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah. I once flew there. This is embarrassing. I once, this, I'm causing all the climate change that Steve is enjoying because I flew there on a miles run uh, at the end of a few years ago. I needed to hit a certain number of miles and I happened to find really cheap tickets to Alaska. A so miles I f- run. I flew Delta. I needed to hit a certain number of like miles traveled to hit the medallion status for the following year. So, between Christmas and New Year's, I flew from New York to Seattle to Alaska back to Seattle in like 24 hours. Oof. <laughs> Just for the miles. And, That's uh, so funny. Yeah. It was uh, probably not worth it in the end. And again, for climate <laughs> change. But, um, but I did get diamond medallion status for any of my uh, fellow Delta obsessives. And it was very big for my ego. So this is um, awesome. Yeah. This is what happens when you don't have any hobbies. Uh, is you end up in situations like this. <laughs> did you like sightsee a little no. bit or did you just no. go from gate to gate? I literally, I landed, I, I guess I landed in Anchorage and I had four hours and I slept in a little kind of landing area uh, on the floor and I got back on a flight return and returned. Like I had to hit it before the end of the year and I had thought right. I was going to make it and then I didn't. Oh, It was like kind of fun to fly to nowhere in a way because I was just everyone's like we're going on a trip we're coming home and I was like I'm not doing anything I'm literally just sitting here and watching a TV show yeah I don't know that it's the best use of my time ever but uh, but I have technically <laughs> been to Alaska Jay I had six of those Delta biscotti cookies oh yeah man those are good oh my god I always say can I have two please they're my favorite I and found they, those they at they Costco by the way I had give... a whole sleeve of them yep I got a whole sleeve once and it was Gone in three days. <laughs> but are, are they as special when you're not getting it only on plane flights? No, they're great. Yeah, yeah. after like you have like a dozen, <laughs> it's like, all right, these are still awesome, but it's not quite as special as being on a plane and getting just a few of them. That's right. Like I don't really drink soda very much, but I'll get a Diet Coke on the plane and I always really like it. And I think apparently it's very annoying for flight attendants if you order soda because the carbonation is, is much higher and so it's more of a pain to pour. But I once had oh. a Diet Coke recently on the ground, and it wasn't as good. And I think, A, it's less carbonated, but B, there, there is a special kind of ritual to it when you're flying. <laughs> I remember when we were kids, right? I don't know if you guys remember this. There was this one restaurant where we could get root beer. Mm. And that was the only time we ever had root beer. Cause, and I think we all just assumed, because we're kids and we don't know what's going on, we don't know how the world works, <laughs> that that was it. That was the only place you could ever get mm. root beer. Until eventually... Like, you could just buy it at the store. And you probably always could buy it at the store. We just didn't know it. Right. And then (laughs) once we had, like, a bottle of root beer in our refrigerator, it was no longer quite as special because it wasn't, like, the kind of thing that happens once or twice a year, only when you go to this one restaurant. You know what I mean? One of the best college lectures I ever attended was in a, I believe it was an intro microeconomics course where we were learning about diminishing returns and... The professor did this exercise where he had a student volunteer. He said, who's a student who's like willing to eat a lot right now and it's you're not allergic to popcorn or whatever? And so he had the student sit in the front of the classroom and had a little thing of popcorn, like a little movie container, and said, have a few bites of popcorn and describe how you're feeling. And he was like, oh, it's really good. Oh, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, it's great. And then have a little more. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really good. And then over the course of, you know, it was almost child. I don't even know if you could get away with this. This was the early 2000s. You could do whatever you <laughs> wanted in the classroom at the time. Uh, 9-11 hadn't happened, you know, we, we could do whatever we wanted. And so he would eat all this popcorn and, and reported, you know, we watched in real time. He was like, oh, I've kind of had enough. Like, eh, it's not that interesting anymore. Like, I'd really rather stop. And, uh, and so we all witnessed it in real time, which I thought was a very creative way to describe what's otherwise kind of a dry concept. Yeah, then you get 
Homer in the front of the class and he's eating those donuts in hell and it just like it never doesn't yeah. work as torture because he, <laughs> he he depletes the entire supply in hell. Yeah. The uh, that was the room of ironic punishment. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> All right, Bob, why don't you start by yes. telling us about silicon spikes? Silicon spikes. Yes. Thank you, Steve. This is your quickie with Bob. Uh do you like silicon? How about silicon spikes? How about silicon spikes that kill 96% of the viruses that get on it? Would you like those? That's exactly what an international research team led by RMIT University has designed and manufactured. This is really cool. The inspiration for this material came from that one place that has already done millions of years of R&D, and that, of course, is nature. Uh, In this case, the inspiration were the wings of insects like dragonflies and cicadas, uh, which have tiny spikes to kill bacteria and fungi on them, fungi on them, fungi, fungi, fungi. Uh, The process to create a similar surface, though, to kill viruses had to be, had to create spikes that were far smaller because viruses are, in fact, far smaller, generally speaking, than bacteria. Uh, The researchers started with a smooth silicon wafer, which they then slammed with ions specifically and selectively uh, to remove material, leaving the spikes on the surface, which were pretty tiny, as you might imagine, only about two nanometers thick, uh, which is 30,000 times thinner than your hair and uh, only 290 nanometers high. Uh, they tested it on HPIV3 virus, which causes bronchitis, pneumonia, and croup. And it, they showed that within six hours, 96% of the viruses were either totally ripped apart or damaged beyond function. They say that this material can be incorporated into commonly touched devices and surfaces to prevent viral spread and reduce the use of disinfectants. By doing so, we aim to create safer environments for researchers, healthcare professionals, and patients alike. Very cool. Hope to see that in the hospital near you soon. This has been your Quickie with Bob. Back to you, Steve. That was quick. Yeah, that's a Quickie. All right. Thanks, Bob. Let me ask you guys a question. Have any of you heard of Havana Syndrome? Yes. yes. Yeah, I have heard of that. Yeah. What do you know about it? Well, they thought they thought it was they some the Russians poisoned people, right? Yeah, they thought it was a de- <laughs> they thought it was a device that, that was being used by the Russians to mess with people, like a di- like diplomats and people. Right. And uh, but then recently, there's a, a new bit of information that I guess you're going to discuss about it. Yes. But it was a big mystery for many years, right? Oh, All yeah. these these diplomats are, are for you know mostly U.S. government officials, I b- I believe, and they were having like headaches and and. You know, we thought it was like this weird sound, and it was it was quite mysterious for quite a long time. And it's there was nothing else like it anywhere, and, and no one really knew what to do about it. Yeah, you guys sort of know the news item, so you have, we got a lot of the details right there. It started in 2016. Uh, there was a cluster in the U.S. Embassy in Havana, Cuba, hence Havana Syndrome, uh-huh. of people feeling that they were dizzy, they felt lightheaded, they were getting migraines and headaches. They were confused, like they couldn't think. They had a ringing in their ear. Sometimes they describe like a buzzing or a pulsating noise, like a bizarre noise in their room, in their ear. It was very disruptive. Some of them claimed that they only had those sensations when they were like in a certain room. And if they left the room, they would feel better. And if they went back to that room, they would get the symptoms back. Hmm. Hmm. That And that's kind of like the most interesting feature of Havana Syndrome, although... Not everybody displays that feature, right? So the question has been basically one of two major hypotheses here. Either this is due to, as you say, some foreign power, some foreign adversary, let's say, not necessarily Russians, could be Chinese, could be North Korea, could be somebody else. We don't know. Some foreign adversary using some kind of you know, cutting edge or experimental device to induce these symptoms at a distance uh, in people. Uh, and the the two thoughts were that either it's a pulsed sonic device, yeah, or a pulsed electromagnetic device. Those are sort of the two ideas. the The people who were experiencing this were American and Canadian diplomats mm. and military personnel, right? So that's the the cohort: American and Canadian diplomats and military personnel. There hit. There has been some investigation. We do have some new data, but. I'll say, we'll cut to the chase a little bit, is that the, this, the answer is not yet definitive. Oh. There is still some debate and disagreement about what the ultimate answer to this is. Um, there are two main hypotheses, right? One hypothesis is that this is an actual 
attack by a foreign adversary using some kind of device, as I mentioned, some kind of ranged device that induces these neurological symptoms. The other hypothesis is that this is a mass delusion, right? Yeah. Hmm. These were pre-existing conditions or people with whatever new onset migraines or benign positional vertigo, like known neurological phenomena that maybe there was a coincidental cluster right. and, that, and that led to the belief that maybe something is going on, which then takes on a life of its own. Right. right? And mm. it's like power of suggestion. Exactly. Oh, I am feeling funny now that you mention it. Kind of. Yeah. And yeah. We've, we've spoken on the show before about so-called sick building syndrome, where like mm-hmm. somebody oh, in yeah. a building has an asthma attack and somebody else has an asthma attack. And then pretty soon like there's black mold in the building and whatever. There's, mm. there's, <laughs> there's, it's, there's believed to be something environmental in the building that is making people sick. And then you have all these other cases, which may be partly due to suggestion or just confirmation bias, or just you're looking for it more, where mm-hmm. people are more alert to their own symptoms. You know, it's like, I'm having a little bit of a scratchy throat. You know what I mean? Like, it's very yep. easy. It's not necessarily like you're delusional or you're psychosomatic, although some people probably are, right? If enough people could potentially be involved. You're going to you, you're gonna run into that. But um, it, it's also, it could just be a little bit of confirmation bias and people don't realize how much background symptoms there are, you know, in any building of people. And, you know, people, you might underestimate how many people are actually working in a building and you don't realize that right. it's not that unusual for 10 or 20 people to all be having these symptoms. I mean, we all experienced a version of that, not in a building, but in COVID when, you know, of course people were getting very, very sick, but every single day when they would list out all the symptoms, I would sit and I'd be like, my throat is itchy. I can't draw a full breath. Like what is, you know, we would yeah, all yeah, yeah. kind of convince ourselves that what was in a sniffle that I wouldn't have thought twice about, you know, because I stirred up some dust was now something to, to, to be worried about. Yeah, we call that being hypervigilant, right? You there become hypervigilant is. about symptoms. And then just the background noise of day-to-day symptoms of life, if you focus on it, yeah. you can convince yourself that, oh, yeah. is my throat a little scratchy today? Am I feeling a little hot? You know, Steve, I- did, did they not find anything? So, all right. But let's break it down. Okay. So here we have this question. And I have, I, honestly, we haven't spoken about this on the show and I haven't written about this until now because I wasn't quite sure what take to, you know, would be the best or the most appropriate one on this because the, the information is just so ambiguous. But let's, let's break it down and see if we, and, and work our way through it. And I'll tell you the, the bits of information that we have as we go along. So when, when we are confronted with a claim like this, Havana syndrome. Is it real? Is it not real? You know, how do we decide what is the likely, you know, to be the, what's the, what's the better answer? Whether What's the more likely answer? Maybe we just don't know. We have to just say it's currently unknown. Uh, so one thing we could do is we could a- analyze it based upon plausibility. How plausible is the alleged phenomenon? So here there's a few elements that we could pull apart. One is the plausibility of the technology itself, like our pulsed sonar, you know, guns or pulsed EM projectors. Is that technology plausible? And it is. There's, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, there's nothing implausible about that notion. You know, is it plausible that such a device could cause the symptoms people are reporting, right? These what are called, they're the, the government's calling them anomalous health incidents, AHIs. Reminds me of the um, unidentified anomalous mm. phenomena. Yeah. They always have their diplomat speak, their government speak. And there, I think now I'm sort of putting on my neurologist hat. Like, could a pulsed sonic weapon, you know, cause people to have like migraines and tinnitus and and feel dizzy? And the answer is absolutely yes. Those are all oh, things yeah. that could be triggered. You know, people who have a pre have have migraines or maybe have a predisposition to migraine like phenomena can be triggered by varying pressure in the air. Absolutely. The, the interesting, the closest I came to that, one of the cars that I have, if you open the windows to a certain amount, mm. yes. and you're driving at a certain speed, yeah, you get this pulsating pressure in the car from the wind. Yeah, it makes me want I, to throw up. Yeah. I, yeah, right. It makes me want to throw up. I can't stand it. <laughs> oh my I God, it's torture. It. Yeah. It's torture. Yeah, yeah. My wife is not bothered by it at all. Oh my well, God, she's I weird. It. Yeah, no, I'm I'm pretty sensitive. My boyfriend is even more sensitive, and if you like even pass through that level on the way to a better level of the window, he'll be unwell. Yeah, yeah so there you go, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, we all <laughs> a, lot, a lot of us have experienced a similar kind of thing. Imagine if you had an, a you know device that was designed to maximize that and was aimed right at your head. You know, wow. 
So anyway, totally plausible that it could cause the symptoms being reported. It feels very sci-fi on, in a fun yeah, way. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah it does. But, but it not, not like breaking the laws of physics, right? Right, right. Yeah. So we could take a, like a techno- technology plausibility, a medical plausibility, and then we have to go to a intelligence agency plausibility, right? So what do we know from an intelligence perspective, a military perspective about does anybody have this technology? Have they ever used it? Mm. And was there any investigation? And did they find anything? So uh, the American intelligence agencies have investigated Havana syndrome, right? From a, you know, from a spy perspective, not like a medical or technological perspective. And they could find no evidence that such a device exists or was in use or that there was any identifiable perpetrators. So the intelligence investigation came up negative. Hmm. So now we could, I, I think we could ask some further plausibility questions given the negative investigation. Is it likely that such a device could be used and, and, uh, and we missed it? Our intelligence agencies mm. were not able to detect it. I don't honestly know the answer to, to the question of how yeah. plausible that is. Are they saying like, listen, we, they always just say there was no evidence of anything, blah, blah, blah. But I, I haven't heard an interview with somebody saying either, look, if this were happening, we would know. And, yeah. and we, right. Or it, who knows? It could be, we didn't find anything, but we probably wouldn't. Like if this was spies doing this and then with a portable device that they then scrolled away, how would we know? You know, right. I don't know. I don't know where along that spectrum it is. Or if it was for, if they were using it previously on an individual, the mm-hmm. individual might just say, well, I wasn't feeling well and I went home or whatever. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, the other thing is you could think that they're lying to the public. I think that's very implausible for a couple of reasons. One, why would they? Yeah. You know, again, the motivation is not there. Why wouldn't they say, yeah, we caught the Chinese doing this to us and aren't they bad and they're breaking diplomatic protocol and blah, blah, blah. Right? I mean, they would just leverage yeah. that yeah. for political purposes. I mean, we heard about the balloons. We'd hear about this. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and also, they're, you know, they're not supposed to lie to the American public, whatever would you believe that they adhere to that or not. But I just the fact I just don't know why they would lie about that. It seems like it would be more advantageous to tell us the truth. Right. So, yeah. so I don't know how that affects overall plausibility. But it's, it's I think it it has to move it down at least a notch that they weren't able to discover, you know, like who was doing this and and any evidence that this was actually an external attack. Mm. And they concluded that you could explain all of the cases on the basis of pre-existing conditions and environmental factors. Hmm. That was their conclusion. All right, now we come to the new bit, and that is taking a look at this from a medical perspective. So if we examine the people who have these AHIs, the anomalous health incidents, can we detect anything objective that might indicate that they were subjected to this external attack, Hmm. right? Yep, that makes sense. Right, so that makes sense. So there was a study a few years ago where they looked at MRI scans and they they looked at people who had Havana syndrome and people who didn't have Havana syndrome, and they found some differences in their brains. Mm. So they found, for example, that the people who had the symptoms had a little bit more atrophy, like shrinkage of the brain tissue, than the people who, who didn't have it, um, for example. That was a 2019 study. Now, it was a small study, and I read through it. The thing that gets me is that it was kind of an exploratory study. They were just saying, hey, let's see if we could find anything, right? They didn't really have any very specific hypothesis. Mm. And the things that they found seem kind of random to me. It's not the things that I would expect. And in fact, it would be perfectly reasonable to find nothing given the symptoms. Like if people are having like migraine-like symptoms, they wouldn't necessarily have to have any objective findings. Did they know who had been... Uh, experiencing Havana syndrome when they were looking at it, like, or was it randomized blind or blind uh, study? Uh, actually, I don't know. So okay. I'm a, I, I would imagine it was a blinded evaluation. Of course, it wasn't randomized. Right. They, they yeah. needed the people. <laughs> it was retrospectives. Like you, you've right. had Havana syndrome. Okay, let's take a look at your brain. Yeah. You know? But they didn't know, like, okay, this is a Havana syndrome brain. Let's see what we can see. So they at least protected against that. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. All right. But now there were two follow-up studies published this year mm-hmm. where they, they did a larger sample size and they did a more detailed analysis. Well, how many people are we talking about? Uh, in the new one, I think I had 60 people. The oh, old one was more many? like 20. Oh, my God. I was thinking of a handful of people. Yeah. No, no, how no. many people were affected by it? 
Do we think? But in this study, they had 81 participants who experienced it and 48 matched controlled participants wow. was the recent study. So that's a good number of people. Yeah. They found no difference mm. in the brains, none whatsoever. So those findings did not replicate. And, it, and not only did the specific findings not replicate, they found no differences. Now, that these more current studies have come under some criticism. So specifically, there was an, when the studies were published, they were published with an accompanying editorial by Dr. Relman, who was one of the neurologists who was part of the original government investigation of AHI, the Havana syndrome. And he says has a lot to say about, you know, he thinks it's real, right? He thinks it's a real neurological external attack by foreign adversaries. Uh, I think the most salient thing he had to say was that the the recent studies did not specify whether the the individuals with Havana syndrome had the location specific feature, and he thinks that's the most specific feature. And so that they, that means they might be including a lot of people who don't have Havana syndrome, who just have migraines or mm. vertigo or whatever, okay. and that would dilute out any findings. So it's like, okay, uh, yes, technically that's true. I'm not sure that that really invalidates the results or that you, we wouldn't see that. You could go back and do a subgroup analysis. I think that would be an easy way to deal with that. But it's nevertheless, you know, I think that these, you know, the fact that these studies didn't replicate the findings, again, it doesn't put it to rest, but it's, it's another blow against the notion that this is a, a real phenomenon, I meaning a specific there's some specific external attack happening as opposed to just, you know, pre-existing conditions or, or you know, some new onset known neurological phenomena, migraine, et cetera. Steve, yes. is there any data that you got to see that would give you an opinion on what's going on personally? No, no, not really, no. Hmm. I have been sort of paying attention to this and I've been reading into it. I, you know, I wrote about it recently, so I did, a, you know, a, a fairly decent deep dive. There, I, I don't have any, like, good firsthand information it's all just these like conclusions based on analyses and data, et cetera. I would you know, like to get a little bit more details and I could be persuaded one way or the other. Right now, I think we just don't know because it's plausible, and but, but we haven't found any smoking gun, right? Either biologically or through intelligence investigation. So what does that mean? So I, I think if, let's say this is a real phenomenon. The other thing is it's been... Uh, eight years, I would think by now, wouldn't yeah. they have caught the guy? You know what I mean? Wouldn't that you was have my figured, question. Yeah. You know, after eight years, I could see if we were two years in, you could say, hey, we have to, you know, they're doing their investigation. Who knows? I think the more time that goes by without us figuring out like who did it right. makes it less likely. I think eight years is kind of a long time. It's like, um, oh, there is that guy holding the funny looking pulsar yeah. gun, but nah, he's probably fine. Yeah. And I couldn't <laughs> yeah. put like an EM detector in the embassies around the world the american embassies and or or pressure to, to sense it you know detectors like we can detect these things you know yeah if your Why? head can detect them we have instruments that can detect them i mean but, are there still ongoing attacks or is it like yeah there was this period that was weird and you know the big thing that got it started and that's it or are people still experiencing this when they're in havana so i, I don't think it's it's not specific to havana these have been reported now all around the world oh i thought it was just havana no. I see. wow yeah. okay uh, so that's another thing. And that, and here's the other possibility. So even if it's possible that this was a real external attack or they were testing this new weapon to see how disruptive it would be or whatever, but it was very limited, but that that sparked the mass delusion, right? Yeah. yeah. And then everything else. <laughs> follow. So it, right. It, and in fact, if this is real, I'm sure there is also a penumbra of delusional cases or just, yeah. you know, confirmation bias, whatever. There's, there are cases that are not real that are just being attached to it. I Absolutely. would be the first to claim such a thing. I'm a power of suggestion yeah. is something fierce for me. I'm like, I have it. I'm it's, yeah. <laughs> I watched so, the diplomat. I'm but experiencing if it's, it. I think if it's not real, yeah. we'll never know. Like it'll never, we'll never be able to put it to death, to put it to bed. See, why outrule a poison of some kind? Uh, because that's not the claim, right? Okay. It, it, because that wouldn't explain why it's, Again, the most specific feature is the location specificity, which implies some kind of directed weapon, you know, directed effect, effect well, my, some space-related effect. 
yeah. question, and maybe this is naive, is is to what end, if this were a plot, you know, some spy, some something, is it they're they're disrupting meetings or they're they're making people who are government officials uncomfortable? And what are they? That's doing? a good question, <laughs> and I don't think that really cuts either way, in my opinion. Because yeah. do governments do stupid things sometimes? Sure, would you know? Could you? I could imagine them saying, "Oh, we could," you know disrupt the military intelligence meetings or whatever by yeah. doing this. And, you know, they thought that this would somehow be worthwhile and it turned out to be a bust. And yeah. So they gave up. So they gave it up, you know. Yeah. Um, it turned out to be a mild annoyance or whatever, you know. Yeah. And, and they're really giggling now, like, Haha, look, look what we caused. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so like, I, I don't think it was a big geopolitical success, you know, in terms of, you know, whatever device that they were using, but they probably were trying to see is what potential yeah. does it have if, again, yeah. if this is real. So I, I at this point I think I think it's probably more likely than not that is that it isn't real but um but I but it's not a I'm not firm on that I think there might be a real phenomenon at the core of this and then surrounded by again just cases that sort of attach to it and I think the lack of any biological smoking gun is I think it's irrelevant honestly I wouldn't expect there to be to be honest mm. with you given the symptoms. That people are reporting and the mechanism, like we don't see anything in people with migraines. They don't, right? Can't see right. that on your MRI scan, you know. I was going to ask because I get migraines, and I was like, "Am I is my brain tissue smaller than everyone else?" It may be, but it's not. No, of I mean, you have yeah. a little bit more white matter changes with age, oh. right? Like it's the same thing if you have a little bit of hyper bl- high blood pressure or diabetes, or if you smoke or whatever. All these things could increase, like the amount of white matter lesions and and migraines are one of those things. But it's very nonspecific. You can't mm. really diagnose migraine based upon that is and and you don't always have that it's just like if you're Mm. 50 or 60 and we see a little bit more than we would expect for age and you have migraines like ah it's all it's all right migraines there's there's no smoking gun but there wouldn't necessarily be one so i think at the end of the day we just don't know it wouldn't really surprise me either way if it's right in that zone yeah like blurry ufo images you know what i mean Mm -hmm. So, although I think that we, I'm much more confident that we're not being visited by aliens, right? I mean, I think that their, you know, the yeah. plausibility is really, really low, and and the evidence, like we would expect there to be evidence that there isn't. Et well, cetera. Steve, I think the only evidence you need is that these aliens are causing people to experience Havana syndrome. There you go. Is yeah. the aliens are doing yeah. it? Yeah. But but it's interesting too because you know we think about our biases as a skeptic. So like certainly. I like you know as a skeptic the mass delusion explanation would be far more satisfying mm-hmm. right because it fits the skeptical narrative it would be a we we understand mass delusions we know where a lot of historical cases this would be a great one to add to our list mm-hmm. you know as yeah, I wrote right. like every skeptic talking about this topic would have a slide about Havana syndrome where like <laughs> see it's a cautionary tale we, yeah. we et cetera et cetera but I don't think we're quite there. I think, you know, mm. that the door is yeah. still open for, yeah, this may have been some, some hostile entity experimenting with a pulsed. I think this, the sonic weapon is actually more plausible than the EM one, but I totally believe that some kind of pulsed sonic thing could have made people to fear, feel bad and have migraines and not feel nauseated, et cetera. And then didn't really do, do enough to make it worthwhile. Then people started talking about it. So they stopped doing it and they covered their tracks and, you know, that would, is, per, is compatible with all the information that we have. And even the part where it's happening all over the world, not just in, you know, the initial location? Again, if it's a real phenomenon, there's also not real parts of it. Right. Definitely. Because that yeah. you would, there would almost have to be. Right? That's just the nature of the beast. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be 100%. Like every case of, of Havana syndrome is real. Right. Um, Which is true for every case of, you know. Yeah. Any of, disease. Of everything. Yeah. <laughs> of everything is the real one. And then the rest of us who feel like we also have it. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right, right. You're right. No, it is a nice story from a skeptical perspective. Um, and I need to check my own lack of skepticism because I like how nice it would be to be like, yep, we're all delusional. Yeah, right. It'd be nice. But yeah, but it's good to break it down. And so yeah. this is how you analyze it and this is how you think about it. Yeah. So, Andrea, you're basically calling them all liars. Is that what That's I mean? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm experiencing it right now. I don't know what you all are talking about. Oh, but, I'm uh, feeling it, man. I'm yeah. disoriented. Yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty good. <laughs> They're not interested in you, Bob. Okay. They want they want the state secrets from Jay and me. Mm. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. All right, Jay, tell us about robo taxis in New York. Right, let's start here. Let's start with this. We're all in New York City together, right? We hail a taxi, and a, and this is happening tonight. 
you know, everything that you know of right now, right? And a driverless car pulls up. Mm. Would you guys want to get in or not? Sure. Th- We're in the middle of the city? Right now, in New York City. Yeah, I'd do it. I think my bias is if the Novella brothers will do it, I'll come. I don't know if I would do it on my own. Bob? Would we know about it? If it came as a surprise, like, wait, what, what's happening? We, then, I'd be, we, then I'd be a little skeptical. But if we we're like, oh, yeah, let's try this new service, I'd want to read up on it. So Steve's a yes. Andrea is I'll do what we do. Bandwagon effect. <laughs> Bob, you're, you're being skeptical. I, you know, personally, my, my answer would be I absolutely would not get in. Yeah? Yep, not yet. We're not there yet. As far as this is what I'm, you know, this is what's in my head, right? You know, we all have a little bit different information going on. You know, the reason why I ask is because this is going to be a choice that some people are going to be faced with at some point soon in New York City. You know, maybe not like in the next few months, but it could probably, you know, maybe within a year or so, this could be happening. So what New York City did, they they made public this new safety requirements that they came up with. You know, you can think of them as requirements and guidelines. This will be for testing autonomous vehicles in the city. Mm. So outside companies that want to test AVs are required to have, you know, of course, there's a whole bunch of stipulations. They have to have something called a safety driver behind the wheel. This isn't some rando person that they just hire. And, and, you know, it's not like somebody uh, working for Instacart. Like this is actually... (laughs) Shots fired at Instacart, but okay, yeah. But this is a real deal. Like this is yeah. like going to be someone that's really trained. So this this was, um, you know, this training and this dri- having a a, um, a safety driver in the car has not been required in other cities. Like Phoenix, you know, didn't do that. They just let people let the driverless cars do their testing and didn't require a safety person in there. But New York is is really pushing it, saying no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to have we're going to have humans, you know, behind a wheel and watching the whole time. So the guidelines also stipulate that only companies with prior testing experience in other cities will be considered for the permits um, and that the permits will last a year. Now, they could be renewed, of course, but they have to renew every year and and there's hoops to be jumped through every time you renew them. The safety drivers have to have, of course, a current driver's license. They have to pass background checks. And when they're testing, they're required to take breaks so they can keep keep their focus up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you don't want someone being a safety driver, having to concentrate for hours at a time. Like, I think they would be giving them breaks, you know, quite frequently. Also, to comply with New York City's safety protocols for autonomous vehicle testing, the applicants need to outline the selection and training process for their test operators. This this essentially means that the companies have to very openly show exactly what they're going to be doing to train their drivers. You know, it has to pass whatever the people working for New York City say. Like they're basically going to, you know, give them stipulations that they're going to have to meet. They have to make sure the testers follow the Society of Automotive Engineers best practices. And they'll have to do background checks, like I said, and give the drivers tons of specific training on how to be a test driver. Now, this is, you know, again, this is happening in New York City. And this isn't the case in other places where they've had driverless cars. And I think it's the right thing to do. I think we're not at that stage yet where we could just be testing driverless cars without having a backup, particularly particularly yeah. in New York City, right? <laughs> Jay, is this going to be the kind of service where like, they, they scan the city and the, the, these cars are going to be working off of an internal map of the city? I, I didn't find anything specific on that, Steve, but I was taking my own notes, like asking questions just like you did. So I, I would assume that they're going to have to do that because you know it's not just going to be using global positioning. Mm-hmm. Like They're going to have to know very specific details, like things like this. At four o'clock, you know, the grid is going to get really tight. You know, they're going to have to pick different routes. They're going to have to change the the car's behavior because there's going to be way more people in the street at four than there would be at two because of rush hour. Like like all that, you know, city specific, corner specific data that needs to be collected. And the, the scary part, but the, you know, good but scary is that there's cameras everywhere in New York City. They could easily be already collecting this information if they already or already don't have a good, you know, dossier on it already. You know, I don't know, but I would imagine that they're going to get as detailed as possible on this. I mean, one of the things that actually is sort of heartening about it being in New York City, and I guess it, it depends on where in the city, like I... I would hope it would stay off of the the highways, sort of the FDR and, and, and the West Side Highway, because most of the time, especially in high traffic periods, cars are going very slowly. The The concern, obviously, is that they would hit pedestrians. But if anything, I would hope that they would engineer them in such a way that they'd be too cautious around pedestrians and then just never go. And that would be the pro- like the, the main reason pa- traffic progresses during rush hour is because some dude decides that he's going to run a red light, even though... 
uh, he really shouldn't because the pedestrians are about to take over. And so if the cars are more cautious, we're actually probably going to get more traffic, which is a good problem to have compared to cars recklessly sprinting, you know, up and down these streets. Like if anything, I think that the high density might be safer for testing or you'd have more bumps, but fewer fatalities. I, I, I don't know, but it, it it's almost... hard to predict, right? You know, cause yeah. like people who know, or, or, or you know, New York city, I know New York city and New York city traffic very well. And I know you do too, Andrea. There is some type of ballet in the chaos mm-hmm. though, right? Like, yeah. like as a human, I understand if you're getting into the left lane and you're going to be making a left-hand turn, don't do it too early because you're going to piss people off. Yeah. If you're four blocks before that turn, you know, cabs are going to be like trying to get around you. You know, there's all of these, you know, heuristics that we come up with as drivers that frequent the city that you have to understand. And those cars have to understand that human level thinking yeah. in order to kind of get with the flow. Because I, they didn't say how many vehicles they're going to allow in the city at one time. And, and I hear what you're saying about it having an effect on traffic. And it absolutely will. I mean, especially in the beginning when they haven't really tweaked it up. But you know, if you were to to replace fifty percent of the cars in New York City with this, right, then their behavior would mm-hmm. kind of take over in yeah. a sense. You know what I mean? Oh, sure. Which I think in the long run will be way better because you won't have those crazy cab drivers that are going sixty miles an hour. Right. I don't drive very often. I don't have a car, but I am definitely part of the problem in that I will do the last minute get to the left lane so I can turn without having to wait or slow anyone down. And you know, oh, it's yellow, but I'm going to go through because otherwise I'll sit there forever. Like it's no good. And if everyone drives like me, you're going to be in a place. Uh, I used to say that when I was living in China. I was like, everyone in China drives like me, and that's bad. Uh, and so there's yeah. just chaos all the time. And so you're right. I think there would be a threshold effect after which we would all be really following the rules, and it could actually be more orderly. In yeah, the I was end. envisioning, you know, I don't know what country this is from, or it's definitely happening in multiple countries. But, you know, you ever see like those just fantastically complex, crazy traffic systems where like, it's almost like a bunch of you know insects yeah. moving from one place to another because when there's enough people that are kind of pushing in to cross the street, then the cars will kind of stop and yep. then they'll sneak around. That chaos is like the extreme version of what we're – like New yes. York City is not that chaotic. But th- those cars are going to have to be able to handle like really complicated, quick and life-threatening decisions because of just – you know, the stakes are pretty damn high in New York City when it comes to, to driving. Well, I'm almost thinking of those stories you would hear about when uh, we're, we're training, you know, algorithms that play computers to play chess. And they do really well against really good chess players. But you put them up against a novice who does all kinds of random crap. They yeah. actually don't perform as well. I feel like the robots have to deal with that because in New York, it's just all manner. I mean, I ride bikes a lot in New York, and then there's the, the e-bikes that people are on, and there's scooters, and people are weaving in and out, and, and it's just – I'm going to keep an eye out now more. Like, I don't think a robot – like, the algorithm would have to be pretty nuanced, you know? It's like, oh, at First Avenue, you can kind of do that right, even though you're not supposed to, because otherwise you'll never get anywhere or whatever, you know? Yeah, so let me tell you some more things that, that I think are, are pretty interesting. So the applicant companies are also going to have to give comprehensive overviews of their AV technology – you know the automation level, the safety performance. Uh, this is the, this will include you know previous testing outcomes and crash records. So New York City is not messing around here. They're like you're going to have to have completely open books with us. You know we want to be on the inside and see everything, um, so we can you know assure residents that this is going to be safe. Which is you know I think is the absolute right way to do it. The New York City uh, DOT Department of Transportation wants to make sure that the AV testing doesn't interfere like we were talking about with the usual traffic flow and overall safety, which is good to hear. But I really don't know how they're going to do that. Like they are definitely making lists of wants here that I would love to see how they become real. You know, like how are you going to get it from like a piece of paper to like actually, you know, built into the software on these autonomous vehicles. The other thing too is, you know, as the, the, the interesting stat here, the safety of driverless vehicles goes down as the number of pedestrians goes up, right? It's Yikes. a Right, it's a one to one. Like as mm. as one goes down, the other one goes up. So, I'd say, like I said before, like I consider New York driving and pedestrian uh, density as pretty damn hostile. And what I'm worried about is they might be trying to, you know, start something in a you know in an atmosphere that is just too aggressive to to learn there. You know what I mean? Like you would think that they would want maybe to- steps. Yeah, like you know, do do something like maybe only let them do it in a certain region at a certain time. Like start out like that, 
can kind of like branch out from there. You know, I know that the testing, like I said, is being is, has been done in other cities, and you know, progress is being made, guys. Like you know, yeah. driverless cars are functioning better today than they were five years ago. They are, like we said many times on the show, though it's a slow, steady creep here. We didn't get to the finish line as quick as we thought. We are making just like battery enhancements. It's not dramatic changes, but worthwhile changes and updates are happening all the time. And efforts like this, I think, can really help. But man, New York City, you know, yeah. I can't get over that. Yeah. I mean, I'm also now thinking through, you know, the there are a lot of cultural differences in terms of how people drive here. And it's if you grew up here versus if you grew up driving somewhere else or if you're a taxi driver versus if you're a courier versus if you're just rented a car and just trying to make your way. Like, I just feel like, yes, there are other places, at least in the U.S., where there are drivers that are like some are commuters and some are local and whatever. But I feel like New York is just such a mix of like, you can't even learn like overall driving styles because it's just such absolute madness. <laughs> yeah. So now that we've we've talked about this guys, Steve, would you change your mind? Well, one of the main reasons why I said yes is because I I I think of New York traffic as being really slow and like you're constantly in a traffic jam. Yeah. So it's not that risky. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, there are very frequently when I'm when I'm in the city, like there's the crazy cab drivers going on your left and on your right and there are streets where you you know, you would think I could I should be able to take a left here. Because, you know, the streets are one way, um, most of them. And then, you know, when you want to take that left, like this particular corner, you can't take a left. Right. You know what I mean? Like there's all of that stuff. Like I I well, would think yeah. right now I would just not do it. I would want to see the safety records and all that stuff. One of the things I found myself thinking about as you describe this, Jay, is like one of the hardest parts about driving in New York is the parking signs are very confusing in some places. And the number of times that either I oh or I Oh my have, God, yes. Right? You I watch have. people, you're like, okay, no standing between four to six. Taxis only from seven to nine. Does that mean I can stay here from six to seven? Do I pay? Do I not pay? And then you get a ticket anyway. And so if these cars can figure that out, you know, my, my brother has a car and when he comes to park near me, we just have to go out and study every single time. Like, well... There's, there's one area that says you can park here except on a school day. And I found myself in my rental car looking up the academic calendar and being like, is there summer? It was like an early May Sunday night. And I was like, is Monday morning a school day? I don't know. Yeah. And you just, it's, it's, it's madness. So if they can figure that out. Andrew, uh, you know what? I thought grateful. about this. I mean, I've been towed in New York when oh, I was yeah. younger. I've been towed. Yeah. Um, let me tell you something. I don't think that that is an accident. I think that yes. is deliberate. Yeah. Because yeah. they make yeah. a shitload of money when they when they tow your car. Yeah, you're you're in it for for hundreds of dollars. It's very expensive. That's true. You know, and, you know if they if they tow a couple of thousand people a day, you know that adds up quick. Yeah. No, these... I totally buy that. There was even people who who would go street to street and they would investigate every sign and then they would create another sign that said it that had the same effect. But in plain language, so it was mm. obvious what the, the stupid sign meant. Right, and uh, and I don't I don't think they still I don't know if they even do that anymore. But I love those people, whoever they were, because those signs piss me off. Literally, I've lived in the same Ridiculous. neighborhood forever, and people will visit and say, "Oh, can we park near you?" And I just have I actually don't know. Uh, like I think if it's before six a.m. on a Sunday, yes. <laughs> but other than that, I really can tell you, it's it's yeah. I think it is on purpose. That's a good point. <laughs> All right, Andrea, you, you sent us a really interesting article yes. about rebellions and cultural memory. Yes. So I was so excited to find this article and so thrilled that our timing for this episode is such that it's that it's relevant. So I was looking up the other day what kind of social science goes on during solar eclipses, particularly total solar eclipses like the one coming up, because there's so much excitement around the solar eclipse for many reasons. And one of the things that I'm reading a lot about, and I'm sure you all are reading it and talking about it, is, you know, there's all this opportunity for citizen science and NASA can take all these great pictures of the sun and da 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 So I was digging around to see if I could find anything interesting related to solar eclipses and social science. And I was so thrilled to find this paper. Uh, now, I want to say it's not peer-reviewed. It's um, a National Bureau of Economic Research working paper. So you can find it online. There's a couple different versions of the PDF. The, most, the one I'm working from is from 2000, uh, 2022. But it's, it's called Eclipses and the Memory of Revolutions, Evidence from China. And now I want to start actually by asking you three, what would you say are the top reasons uh, 
why what causes protests in a society think of like blm or if you want to call january 6th a protest like what are the big drivers of protests that come to mind yeah i would say it's economic yeah that's pretty big right there i mean also if you're a minority you know just not being treated well you know like just not not being equal right in, right from so, your perception so some inequity or inequality right so i'm I have no resources. Someone over there, usually the government, usually someone rich has all of them. So I'm upset or I'm experiencing some other kind of inequality, inequity, lack of justice that often is tied financially, but but is some sort of thing. And so why would you say that one country? So so this kind of level of inequality exists in different forms all over the world. What do you think might make one country more likely to deal with that problem via protests as opposed to deal with that problem via some other route, maybe waiting out elections, maybe, um, you know, uh, some other kind of uh, uh, of uh, disagreement with the government that isn't the pro- protest form. Maybe you go on a boycott or something like that or a sit-in. What, what do you think would make a country more prone to protests? Well, I think probably how desperate the people are. Well, like less fear of like of a, of like a government overreaction. Mm, like less likelihood that you're going to get thrown into jail or more of a belief that it's going to actually do something probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. The general set of research on protests is around, look, there's two reasons, you know, kind of two big levers. If you're like, is this society going to lead in a protest? Like, yes, there's some grievance that's particularly bad. It turns out that it can be equally bad in different places, you know, the level of inequality or the lack of justice in one country versus another or one county versus another is, is roughly the same. And we do see protests in one area and we don't in another. And the big drivers there are, yeah, do you think the protest is going to make a difference? And then the two levers that social scientists have focused on are, one, individually, am I upset enough that I'm going to protest? Sort of like, what's my individual, you know, rational choice calculation on whether or not I should protest, whether it's going to do something, whether I really care enough about this issue. And then the other one is this social uh, aspect, which is, protests happen it's a collective action and so protests tend to happen when i believe other people are going to protest too and this gets to uh the point i think bob you just made which is you know how how likely am i to get what i'm protesting for and am i likely to get thrown into jail and the more of us that hit the streets the fewer of us you know the the higher the chances are that i can protest without they can't put all of us in jail right and so social scientists have been studying protests why do we see protests why do we not see protests Um, in all kinds of different areas and mostly focused on those particular things. Like why would an individual participate in a protest? Like if I'm sitting at home, I see the BLM protests after, uh, you know, George Floyd, or I see these other protests, what makes me individually join it? It turns out one of the biggest predictors there is whether I've been in a protest in the past. So it's your, whatever your gateway protest was, it makes you more likely to participate in future protests. And then the collective action problem is, is there some big thing that's happening that signals to everyone that this is the moment and we can get over the coordination problem of, you know, not running the risk of hitting, I hit Union Square and I'm the only person in there and the police cart me away, right? And so the George Floyd summer is a classic example of this where this big event took place. Everyone in the United States observed this event and then it was, it was very clear like, okay, we're going to take action and that moment is now, which is why we saw it at that particular moment. This paper, so I'm getting to eclipses because this paper says, what about a third possibility or or all three could take place? But what about a third possibility? And this is is a possibility that tends to live more in kind of like cultural and humanities research, which says that some cultures or countries or places have a history or a culture of protest. And I'm not an expert on this, but just anecdotally, France comes to mind for me. I feel like that's one, you know, if there's something going on in the country that people disagree with, protests seem like a first reaction as opposed to, oh, letters to the editor or petitions or elections or, or whatever. And I, I lived in Bolivia for a little while and I felt like every other day there was a protest about something. So some countries, some cultures have a, a stronger inclination to use protests as a tool than other countries, even if you hold constant their level of grievance or inequality or probability of getting thrown into jail or whatever else. So that's kind of the idea, but there's never been a meaningful way to study that. And so you're kind of left with these just so stories that are like, well, there were always protests. And so you're more likely to keep having protests. And if a culture had a protest in the past, it had a protest in the future, but you couldn't ever tease out what was causing it. And like, maybe there was just a lot of injustice during that time. 
So this paper, I just am stunned, and I, I hope it comes out and is peer-reviewed, and the, it looks plausible to me insofar as I've, I've been able to parse through the data, but they took advantage of a cultural belief in China that it's, it's a Confucian belief that solar eclipses are a sign from the heavens. This is scientific, I promise. Solar eclipses are a sign from the heavens that the emperor is not doing a good job. So during the Qing Dynasty, which is the area that they are the period that they studied, and this was between 1644 and 1912, which is 268 years, so almost three decades. During the Qing Dynasty, Confucianism was kind of the way of life, and they show a bunch of evidence to say that a lot of people believe this. This was kind of the main way of thinking. It was what everyone agreed on. Um, and in the Confucian tradition, any natural disaster or celestial phenomena that happens is interpreted as uh, the heavens weighing in on how well the emperor is doing. So some of these things could be a sign that, oh, the emperor is really great. Some of them could be a sign that the emperor is really bad. And we almost see this in the U.S. where they say, oh, you know, we had Hurricane Katrina because God hates you know, conservatives or whatever, right? Like we, we kind of drum that stuff up. But in this case, it really was taken very seriously. And total solar eclipses were seen as the most, you know, most serious condemnation of the leaders. And total solar eclipses are something that are widely observable by everybody in a particular area. So just like the murder of George Floyd was something that everyone in the U.S. could observe, a total solar eclipse, you know, we have one coming up in the U.S., everyone can see it. And so their argument, and it's like slightly complicated, but it works out in the data in, I think, a pretty compelling way. Their argument is that total solar eclipses happened in China over these 300 years of the Qing dynasty. And during the times that we had these total solar eclipses, that was a coordinating moment for people who were going to have uprisings. And they were largely, Steve, as you said, they were peasant uprisings against inequality of wealth. Uh, they were much more likely during these total solar eclipses because it was a shared signal that, aha, see, the emperor is weak, the emperor is no good, we're going to actually get what we're asking for if we go to a protest. And so they have a, a three-tiered study. Step one is, are peasant uprisings in the Qing dynasty more likely during total solar eclipses in China? And they map uh, uh, protest data against NASA data on total solar eclipses and find, lo and behold, yes, you are more likely to see protests during the periods when there is a total solar eclipse. Then they compare it to protests today, and I believe it's from, you know, 2001 to, to 13 is what they do. So it's not super, super recent, but, but recent enough to be interesting. So they compare protests in China between 2001 and 2013 against the history of protests in these places, and they find that places in China that were in the path of the total solar eclipse way back in the Qing dynasty, this is 1600s, 1700s, and so on, are today more likely to see anti-government protests about wealth inequality than those that were not in the path of totality hundreds of years ago. And I just found it to be stunning. The, 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 some caveats. So, so the magnitude is not massive. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the coefficient here is, is very, very small. So one additional rebellion between 1644 and 1912 predicts 0.2 more episodes of social unrest from 2001 to 2013. But it's, you know, insofar as, as we care, it's statistically robust. And they do a number of different um, uh, estimates. Is it, is it overall protest? Is it protest per capita? Is it protest participants? Is it, is it how serious is the unrest? So it's robust to all of those things. And what's so cool about this to me is they've also made sure that these solar eclipses are orthogonal to anything that might be causing social unrest. So you could be thinking, well, maybe the total solar eclipses in China happened along the coast more often or in an area where there were more farmers and so therefore it was agriculture. And they were able to hold constant those various things and also show that total solar eclipses, you know, they have some maps of the paths, you know, like the one we're seeing in the U.S. It's really stretching across a big stretch of the country and over 300 years there were quite a lot crisscrossing. And so they, I think, pretty compellingly hold, um, hold constant any other effects of like, yeah, something else could have been going on in that area that made it both more likely to have protests and more likely to have social uh, total solar eclipses. So I, I'm a fan of a natural experiment. They're very hard to pull off, 
but this is a very cool one where they they took advantage of this fact that hey we interpret total solar eclipses to mean something therefore we're going to behave in a certain way and now hundreds of years later we're seeing that there are actually slightly more protests in these areas the last piece i'll say on this and it's it's a fascinating paper it's free online again not not perfect the the weakest argument but one that i, I do want to mention because i'm curious what you guys think is is their third one, which is, what is it? What's the mechanism by which this memory, this shared history of protest is passed on from a place hundreds of years ago to now? And it could be storytelling, it could be the people who were involved, it could be the families. They, they zoom in on whether or not after these protests took place, this, this peasant uprising took place, whether or not there were statues or other public monuments put up to commemorate that uprising. So a lot of revolutions in China have been the result of uprisings, and so they play a very, very big role, kind of like how we put you know, civil war leaders in, in statues and, and other things, which obviously is, is controversial. They argue that the places that have these monuments to that social unrest are the ones where you're even more likely to see social unrest today. I find that to be kind of less compelling. A, is that really the, the mechanism? And B, it also kind of muddies the the causal story that they're telling about a about a culture of it like maybe it was it was just something that was so significant therefore i put up a monument therefore i'm going to continue to protest and so i actually think it kind of weakens their argument but overall i think the stark difference of you know if you experienced a total solar eclipse when confucianism was the the rule of the day you're more likely to see protests now i find to be very exciting and you know, you think about parts of the U.S., you think about other parts of the world where we, we follow protests, the Hong Kong protests, and, and it's interesting to think about, you know, the impact of a culture that we're building today for protests. I think about it in light of January 6th and what sort of culture, you know, a single event isn't going to do it, but, but just being able to, to trace this historical effect is interesting, but mostly I think it's just a brilliant research design, and so rarely do we get to see this kind of stuff in the social sciences, so I was just thrilled that they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, on its face, the idea that that cultural memory can last for centuries, I think, is plausible. You know, I mean, I know a lot mm. of people, you know, historians think that there's a lot of a lot in the American character today that derives from mm. the friggin pilgrims. You know what I mean? Like we're more puritanical mm -hmm. than Europe is still after hundreds yeah. of years. Yeah. You look at the different regions of the United States and. You know, they, you know, why are Minnesotans like Minnesotans? Well, because they're, it was settled by people from Nordic countries, you know, and you know what I mean? Like the character of the yeah. people who settled different regions of the U.S. 200, 300 years ago is still, still observable totally. in these regional cultures today. You know, so I think that yeah, to me, it seems totally plausible that there would be some cultural influence that goes back centuries. I mean, Culture is, has a lot of momentum. And from what, I, what you're saying, if I understood it correctly, that cultural inertia is just this sense that we're more likely to protest if we think other people are going to protest with us. And a, an eclipse is when people protest. So that will make it more likely for me to protest. Right. It helps us overcome the, the collective action problem or the, the coordination problem, which is, you know, you know, and that, that's why you see, you know, after George Floyd is such a it's a it's a sad example, but a very strong example of this where there's been injustice against black Americans for a very long time. But then this thing happens and everyone says, oh, I know that if I take to the streets today, a lot of other people are likely to join me because we all just observed this same thing. And then, of course, there's network effects and, and we can we can get each other, um, you know, encourage one another and communicate. But generally speaking, a challenge of protests is 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 this collective action problem. And so it, it's helpful to see a big thing. You know, you think about the Arab Spring, you know, it was the, the incident in Tunisia that, that sparked, literally, I shouldn't have used that word, uh, everyone to take to the streets. So usually something big has to happen. And so their argument is, is this total solar eclipse is a rare enough yet totally shared experience yeah. that helps us overcome this collective action problem because we know that it's a sign that government's not doing their job and what better signal of weakness and what better moment to take to the streets than this. Right. Interesting. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, if any of you are planning on protesting during the, the solar eclipse coming up, but um, I think it, it could be a, a good moment to do it. I think I uh, might just spontaneously do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. If, if there's cloud cover, I will certainly be protesting. Yes, there you go. There you go. Well, the other piece of this that I, I guess I was just excited about is that, and maybe you all are reading this in the news too, is that most of the social science research I find on this, and it's valuable and it's fine, but in most of the research that I'm seeing is, oh, total solar eclipse are a wonderful time for humanity to come together. And the Washington Post had an, argu- an article this week that said, you know, despite our differences and it's a polarized country and blah, 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 we can all experience the same eclipse and won't that bring harmony to our country? And there's a study a couple of years ago that even evaluated tweets and people who were in the path of totality in 2017 were more likely to tweet things related to awe and shared experiences and humanity. And, and those just sort of seem like, I guess, I, I guess that's fine. And I guess that's good. And of course, I, I love that it's like an awesome event and people describe it as life changing and that's wonderful. But but as far as social science goes, I find it more kind of descriptive and, and slightly obvious. Maybe maybe I'm, I'm being jaded. But, um, but this, to me, just the fact that they were able to leverage this into a natural experiment felt very exciting. And I w- wonder what else we could do, you know, take advantage of, of events, natural events that are largely, if not exclusively, orthogonal to human experiences and see what we can learn about humans and societies. Hmm. All right, Bob, tell us how gravitational waves are responsible for human life. Yeah, this was uh, this was kind of uh, an interesting little talk. It reminded me of Connections, the show Connections, Steve, showing the, the linkages between various uh, technologies. So this was a new study that links gravitational waves created by neutron star collisions to the existence of life on Earth as we know it, including, of course, humanity. Hmm. Uh, this paper was submitted to the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and has not been peer Peer reviewed yet. Um, you could see it on the online archive server. The name of the, the study is Do We Owe Our Existence to Gravitational Waves? Now, you may think that colliding neutron stars and the gravitational waves they produce are, you know, quaint and mildly interesting astronomical phenomenon. First of all, shame on you. <laughs> they are far more than that. I know, I'm, of course, I'm kidding. I know everyone is desperately in love with gravitational waves. Even evolution deniers like them. Uh, they're, yeah, they're just just endlessly fascinating to me. So life as we know it absolutely requires many of the fundamental elements of the universe, obviously, right? Hydrogen, for example, is forged in the Big Bang, and it's critical for us for obvious reasons. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, they're high on the you know critically important element list as well. They, they come from helium fusion within, within many, many different types of stars. In total, there's over 20 elements that are generally considered to be a vital importance to our existence. But it depends what website you're looking at, right? Because some websites say there's 20 of them. Some say there's 25. Some say there's 28. So that's why I'm just going to say there's over 20 elements. <laughs> Whichever elements they are, though, if the, if the atomic number is less than 35, as most of them are um, among the, these most important ones, then they were synthesized in giant stars and, and dispersed in supernovae explosions. But two elements, though, that are generally considered to be incredibly important um, they're, they're distinctive, though, in this context. They're iodine and bromine. Iodine is an element found in thyroid hormones, uh, which critically impacts our growth and development, our heart rate, even our body temperatures. Bromine is also in, very, very important. It's critical for collagen scaffolding in our bodies, tissue development in, from, from the most primitive sea creature to the most primitive human. It's, this is very important stuff, elements that are, that are that life on Earth would not be as it is if it weren't for just iodine and bromine. For iodine and bromine, for those elements to exist as we, as we see it, supernovae don't really cut it. Like, uh, like the other elements. The process is incredibly complicated um, in supernovae, and n- we're not sure exactly what's going on and how iodine and bromine are created. A primary source is thought to be neutron star collisions because that's where a wonderful thing happens called the R process. The R process refers to what's called the rapid neutron capture process. Um, this is what's creating these elements and many, many of the heavier stable elements. So this happens when a heavy atomic nucleus holds on to and grabs a series of very, very of free neutrons, one after the other, really, really fast. And it has to be fast because if you have a lot of neutrons jumping into a, a nucleus, it's generally just going to radioactively decay, right? Specifically beta decay. So if it happens really, really fast, though, these neutrons get together really fast. You get two critical things happening. You get a very high density, uh, which is thought to be 10 to the 24 
which is about a septillion neutrons per cubic centimeter. And with that, you also get, as you might expect, a very, very high temperature. For this, it's, about, it's around a billion Kelvin, which is pretty damn hot. Oh. So if you have both of those, that incredible density and temperature, then the, neutron, the neutrons are absorbed and heavier isotopes are synthesized. And so that is a rapid neutron capture process, the R process, that can create many elements, many of the heavier elements, but especially uh, iodine and bromine. Now, like I said before, the R process in supernovae has a lot of theoretical uncertainty with it, and for that reason, the authors don't focus on that. The the one place, though, where, where we are very confident that the R process happens in abundance is a kilonova explosion, which happens when, when neutron stars collide. So now the authors then take a, this step back and they ask, well, what caused this collision that created those critical elements? And they say in their paper, neutron star collisions occur because binary systems lose en- energy by emitting gravitational waves. Uh, so these fundamental physics phenomena may have made human life possible, which is kind of like the, the big bottom line of their study. So uh, in the future, the researchers would like to more solidly link this gravitational waves to human evolution. With the core collapse supernovas, that we're not really sure theoretically and mathematically exactly you know, what's happening with the R process. We're not really sure how much supernovae are contributing to bromine and iodine. So, But the other thing that they suggest is that we could potentially more definitively prove that iodine is created in neutron star collisions to, to really augment their, their argument in their paper. They suggest that we might detect iodine in lunar regolith that could then be tied to a specific historic kilonova explosion. And in that way, we could say, yes, see, there is this this link between gravitational waves and 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 life on Earth. So perhaps we'll see we'll see in the future if they if they do those studies. Um, it's fun though, and that that was my approach to this. It's just fun to imagine, you know, yet another roll of the dice, another contingency of life as we know it on Earth, due this time to an ultimately an incredibly rare collision in the universe, colliding neutron stars. Um, you know, they happen. And we're detecting them, but imagine in the immensity of the universe, it's it's very, very rare. And yet it could be a, a, a critical, they could create a critical component to life as we know it, caused ultimately by their release of gravitational waves. So that was their study. As you were describing it, Bob, I kept finding myself thinking about all those salt containers that I've seen over the years that say, this salt contains iodine, a necessary <laughs> nutrient. And I was like, you don't even know how necessary. <laughs> right. Thank you, Kilanova. Yeah, yeah. I was like, now I understand why I yes. need it. Yeah. Yeah, but again, you know, life evolved to use what was there, right? Exactly. So exactly. if it wasn't there, there would be life that wasn't dependent on its, its existence. The fact that some, there's some stuff in the universe that's unlikely to exist or that is the product of a rare process makes sense. The universe is big. Oh, it's been yeah, around for absolutely. a long time. It, so a lot of rare stuff that happens all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, to me, it was just fun to have this connection between this esoteric astronomical subject like gravitational waves, which a lot of people, if you don't, you know, if you if you listen to this podcast, you have heard me blather on about them many times. <laughs> but for a lot of people, they are just like, whatever, you know, they'd never even heard of it. But And to think that there could be some tight link between something like gravitational waves, which are these utterly ethereal vibrations in space-time itself, mm. could potentially... The auger, the, you know, the existence of, of, of life forms on, on Earth that need these critical elements. And of course, absolutely, if they didn't exist, then life would exist without, without them. But it's just funny to see these connections. Do you think very dense gravitational waves could be causing Havana syndrome? Ah, interesting. Mm. No, because then everybody on the Earth would be uh, yeah. constantly like... <laughs> Nauseous. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, unless somebody has a gravitational wave producer, like a gravitational right. wave gun. Oh God! Good luck with yeah, and it weighs you know a, uh, a nonillion tons. Well, yeah. I didn't say it was practical. And... <laughs> That's the problem with science fiction: is it breaks all the rules. And so it can <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. Yeah, the hard tell way. me a good story. You could break it a little. Yeah. Don't yeah. go crazy with the breaking. You know, I'll give you a couple of gimmies. Yeah. And then tell me a good story with it, and I'll be very happy. But you're right, and and to Steve's point, we could all be sitting here as different forms of life who don't need iodine and bromine to live and, and be talking mm-hmm. about, imagine if we needed those things, how silly we'd be. Yeah, for that, I think it would be, it strikes me that it would be a little bit trivial to get mm-hmm. around them. But if you if you said, yeah, do away with carbon, <laughs> then that's a problem. <laughs> that's that's, a, problem. Problem. that's a, problem. a huge problem. In then you're history. talking about a life form 
that's just like, oh boy, so different, yeah. ridiculously different, and probably you're not as adaptable, not as variable, because uh, as we all know, you know, carbon is just an amazing element to base life around because it just it it, it could it could it's easily changeable and adaptable. It, it could hook up to so many different things that uh, it's really. There's nothing like it. Yeah. You know, there, there could be life forms based on other elements out there. and There probably are, but yeah. I think they would be very diminished in terms of the types of life you could have. I'm hearing that Bob is quite the uh, carbon uh, superiority. Uh, I mean, it supremacy, is. Yeah. Carbon supremacy uh, advocate ha- over here. Carbon <laughs> makes a lot of bonds, and they're very flexible, right? Yeah. So you can go to silicon, which is right below it on the periodic table, and it does make a similar number of bonds, but yeah. they're not as flexible yeah. as carbon is. Yeah. So it just won't have the same chemistry. Carbon chemistry is unique, which is why there's carbon-based life, right? Like there is a whole branch of chemistry dedicated to carbon. It's a pretty easy bet to say that I bet most most life in the universe is you know is based on carbon. You know, it seems like a, a solid bet, but it's, yet again, we have one data point. Who, who knows? Would silicon um, be the next most likely, or is that even that question too muddied by my own? There, there, there's actually a bunch that are that are reasonable to expect. Silicon's kind of up there, I think. And there's there's more. There's even more that can plausibly create some type of life. But as we've been saying, though, nothing is like carbon. Carbon's king in that regard. Carbon is king. All right. Well, we have uh, at least one email this week. This one comes from Malcolm, and he writes, "Great show, as everyone says. Nevertheless, it is. My question: What's the evolutionary benefit of gullibility?" My premise is, one, there appears to be a long history of received wisdom about how the world works, e.g., it is what it is. That goes back to in written texts, at least as far as Gilgamesh, and therefore probably further. This trait, despite on the face of it inclining towards not very useful because, well, reality, dude, has survived and flourishes. Traits can survive without being useful if they're not harmful, but given the small percentage of skeptics that suggest an advantage— Given this, is there an evolutionary benefit to gullibility? And if so, what? Asking for a friend, he says, with a winky eye emoji. Keep it up, guys. Seriously, lots of us out here admire what you do. Thank you, Malcolm. So basically, he's saying that given that gullibility is pretty much a universal human condition throughout history, that it's not useful because it doesn't uh, allow you to track your beliefs with reality, Mm -hmm. and yet it seems to be the dominant form of humanity. Why is that? Is that because there's an evolutionary advantage or benefit to gullibility? What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I think gullibility is is a byproduct of being in a being a social species. Yep. You know, ha- having an open mind, being being social. But I think that culture has amplified and exposed our gullibility. It's it's weaponized it in in ways that you wouldn't have. I don't think you would have seen. You know, centuries ago or or millennia ago. Yeah, I'm I'm inclined towards what where Bob uh, began, which is that yeah, it seems to be kind of like a an outcropping of cooperation, being in a society, listening to one another, but maybe on a collective evolutionary perspective, you know, it's individuals, traits that are advantageous for individuals matter, of course, but traits that matter for groups probably matter even more. And so groups that have higher gullibility, meaning they listen to their leader and will march into war with them, might actually outperform those that think for themselves and separate. And so it actually might cause, you might want cultures yeah. from an evolutionary perspective cultures that are more gullible because then you listen to whoever's in charge and you you like kind of work all the coordination problems we were talking about earlier but i agree with bob that there is a a level at which information either travels too fast or the wrong information travels and, and gullibility becomes a problem and maybe we're running into that but i could certainly see it being an advantage you know if you're if you're trying to defeat another country you want everyone to be as gullible as possible because then they'll listen to you yeah i think the best way to think about evolutionary forces like that uh, selective pressures is that everything's a trade-off you know like we tend to think of like better or worse you know superior and inferior out competing but in reality most evolutionary pressures are a lateral move and most of them involve a lot of trade-offs right and like for example Birds can fly, and flying is a massive advantage in terms of evading but. Pr- predators and hunting for prey and whatever. But Appetite. right comes at a massive calorie cost, energy cost, and therefore you know it 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 persists in species that their behavior makes it a good trade off, but it may tip over to being just not a good trade off, and then they lose their ability to fly. And flightless it, birds. It's not yeah. It's not a an always a net positive. Even having eyes, like if you live in a cave, 
the eyes are a detriment because they're they can you can poke them and get infected and whatever. So you you know there's an advantage to not having them. So especially when you talk about behavior, which is so complicated, I think you guys hit upon the big one. So there's a and there oftentimes not only are traits trade offs, but there are competing traits. Mm. And often evolution is a balance among multiple factors, and and that balance is in some kind of sweet spot. But there's probably a, a a range of different balances that can occur depending on different strategies, even within a population, within a species. You know what I mean? Like you could uh, adopt an alpha male strategy or a beta male strategy in the same species, and they're both viable. They're just different choices that individuals make, which create different selective pressures, et cetera. So I wonder if the same kind of thing is at play here. But I, So I think the other pressure that you guys are talking about is the is the cohesiveness of yeah. your population, your tribe, you know, your your village or people, right? For war is one thing, but not only that, just, hey, we're all going to go over there now. Like, we're all going to migrate to do whatever. Um, we know that humans have hard wiring to listen to our leaders, right? We, there's like MRI studies now that show, yeah, if you're listening to a charismatic leader within your in-group, like it literally turns off your reality testing. Yeah. You get more gullible. You literally get more gullible when you're listening to somebody speak who is charismatic and just you identify with as part of yeah. your group. We've seen that writ large in uh, yeah, yeah. American politics. Yeah. I can't I think, think of who you'd be referring to, Bob, but okay, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you wonder, like, how could somebody like Adolf Hitler capture a country? Yeah. You know? And that's that's how yeah. that happens. Uh, I wonder less these days, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, and we've talked before also about another trade-off, and this is the false positive versus false negative trade-off. So let's say that your friend says, hey, don't go over there. I was over there and I heard a tiger growling, right? Now, are you going to just believe your friend and stay away from there? Mm. Or are you going to say, I don't, I don't know. That could have been anything. How do I know it was a tiger? How do I know this guy isn't lying to me? I'm going to check it out for myself. Um, I think we are descended from the people who just believed their friend and didn't <laughs> go over there and that the people who went over there are, were eaten and we are yeah. not their descendants, right? Yeah. So, th so, so fear is really powerful. It's and so there, there may be an evolution. The evolutionary balance of like false positive to false negative may favor false positives, meaning right. that you're better off believing potential threats, and being gullible actually will probably make you really cautious. Whereas being a curious skeptic may not be the most advantageous in terms of your survival. But it all depends. It's very context dependent. But you could certainly see. How like that trade those balances those trade offs would exist right and right. and they would be different in different contexts at different times different places different cultures etc and also again you, and you hit upon this Andrea although you know the whole idea of group selections are controversial I think still within evolutionary biologists mm. as is many aspects of evolutionary psychology but the idea that are there group level selective pressures you know like or is a can it, the balance of traits within a tribe be selected for are some tribes more likely to survive than other tribes, you know, or other groups of people, other subpopulations, because they have some percentage of their population who's able to do something like lead into war, while other they contain other subsets of people who are more thoughtful and able to problem solve and other groups of people who are more nurturing or whatever, you know, I don't, right. and so it's not like this trait is always in every context superior or more advantageous or selected for versus these other tra other traits it depends on what role you're fitting in society and right and also you know it, it, there's so much variability there's so much neurological variability i have to wonder if variability itself is selected for yeah. you know what i mean huh. right i mean you want a mix of and this is an oversimplification but you want a mix of people who are going to look for the tiger and a mix of people who are definitely not going to look for the tiger. <laughs> yeah, or <laughs> Regard, right. if we think about modern society, you know, we need soldiers and doctors and right. politicians and right. whatever. Like we need all these different and scientists, you know, and teachers. We need all these different kinds of people to make society work and engineers. And thank goodness there are engineers, you know, who, who have a, maybe a different statistical profile neurologically than right. say somebody who is a rock star. Right. Um, although, I don't know. Do we really need rock stars? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, entertainers, you know what I mean? 
What but happens when Brian can't come on the show? We uh, yeah dismiss right, right. it. Yeah. Another thing you said, Steve, made me think about the, you know, you, you mentioned sort of like the, the in-group and the tribe and the, you know, I'm thinking of like you want a sense of belonging and a, one way to have a sense of belonging and communicate is your trust of others is to listen to what they say. But there's also a bunch of research in, in information and communication, which is basically, like you said, like you're listening to a trusted, charismatic speaker. It's an information shortcut. And so at an individual level, it's just easier for me to listen to the person rather than have to work through every single problem myself. Should I take the vaccine? Is this happening? Is this real? Is the earth flat? I just turn to the person who I think is the authority and listen to whatever they say. And so on a local short-term level, it can be very advantageous for me to get these in political science, we call them information shortcuts. I'm sure that's that's a heuristic. Another. Yeah, heuristic. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. like yeah, it's a mental shortcut, and that's you know, listening to experts is not an unreasonable shortcut. They're not always correct though. So right. if it's absolute, you will be led astray at some point in time. And also, yeah. there's the there's the emotional desire for simplicity. If you right. feel overwhelmed, saying, "Well, I'm just going to do whatever this guy says. He's smarter than me. He's more knowledgeable." Whatever well, I he said says, that earlier about do. the yeah. the uh, driverless taxis. So yeah. <laughs> yeah all right jay it's who's that noisy time all right guys last week i played this noisy What do you guys think that is? I mean, it definitely sounds musical, which makes me think that it's some kind of instrument. Yeah, my guess was an AI-generated song of some kind. What do you think, Bob? I think a frog. A frog? You think it's a <laughs> digital frog? I hope, I hope Bob's right. <laughs> All right, well, a listener named Darren P. Cusick, he, he gave me the uh, phonetics for his name. Yeah, okay, I can see that now. I don't know why I can't pronounce the last names. Anyway, he said uh, he's from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Canada, right? Now, wow. have any of you guys awesome. ever been to Saskatchewan? No, I'd love to go. Well, it is like, talk about wide open space. Like, oh my God, it's a huge area of of land north of the U.S. And um, it's very, from what I've read about it, there is not a lot of people that live there. So Darren is one of the few who live in Saskatchewan. Holding down the fort. Good, Darren. So he says he's a long-time listener. This is his first time guessing, and he said, I believe this is an electronic wind instrument, although they can be used to replicate the sound of traditional wind instruments. They are more often used to create synthetic sounds. I'm going to say that is a very good guess. Hmm. Very, very good guess. Not completely there, but but nonetheless a very good guess. Keely Hill wrote in and said, Hi, Jay. I'll guess it's a contemporary song played through an early recording technology like a cylinder record. I know exactly what you're talking about, but you're not correct. Visto Tutti wrote in. He said, woo, whoa, whoa, woo, woo, whoa, whoa, woo. Wow, man, acid flashback to the 90s. Sounds like analog worms attacking. <laughs> <laughs> so then he goes, this is a Korg MS-20 bass synth kicking in the ease. Wow. Man, I think he was drunk when he wrote that. I love it. <laughs> you are incorrect, but I love your answer. And I have another listener here. This listener's name is Osha Johnson. Uh, hi, Jay. Greetings from India. This week's Noisy reminds me of horror movies from the 70s and 80s like Kubrick and Carpenter. So I think it's a, th a synthesizer, probably a Moog. Okay, so all of these guesses are, are provocative and in their own way good. Some more close than others. But let me tell you what the answer is. So the winner for this week is a listener named Jordan, Jordan Smith. And he says... This week's Noisy was definitely a modified sousaphone, right? You guys know what a sousaphone is? No. Well, a sousaphone is very similar to a tuba. Hmm. So basically, a sousaphone is considered a type of tuba. Um, so you, it, for all for the purposes of this game that we're playing right now, just think of it as a as a – I think it's a smaller looking tuba, right? So this is a modified sousaphone used to play dubstep sub-bass noises. The sous the sousa steps on Instagram uses his sousaphone playing to trigger a MIDI note on his synthesizer and has repurposed an e Xbox controlled controller to basically lower the frequency and oscillate the frequency. Very very cool. So let me play this for you again, knowing now that you're basically hearing a modified tuba. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Now, if you played this for me and I had to guess what it is, <laughs> um, some of the the breathing in that instrument sounds like a didgeridoo. Mm. Yeah, you're right. I would have guessed probably something digitally changing a didgeridoo because there it is really cool. I, I didn't realize that the breath in a tuba had a similar, somehow similar, uh, you know, affectation as a didgeridoo does. But very cool. Thought that was really, really a fun one. It reminds me of a Logan's Run. Some, some of the totally sound Bob. effects of Logan's yeah, Run. Yeah, I totally hear that as well. I have a new, a new uh, noisy for you guys this week. It was sent in by a listener named Jared Zimmerman, and here it is. You know, I keep saying this. One of the things I love about Who's That Noisy is that I can hear so many different things that could possibly make Mm -hmm. that noise. When I hear that, I'm like, I don't even want to say it because I'm sure people are going to guess. But I just think that's so cool. Like without context, your brain can, can just assign it to so many different things. Yeah. No, I I can't wait to hear the the range of answers that people send in. And yeah, I'm sure what I'm thinking is very different from what you're thinking. So Andrea, do you know that oh. we're all going to Dallas this weekend? I did know you? that. I am very excited for you. Yeah, I know. We are we're really looking forward to it. I mean, by the time people are hearing this, if you hear this show on the Saturday that it comes out, which will be the 6th, we will be doing an extravaganza that night. And then the the day after, on Sunday the 7th, we will be doing two SGU live shows, almost back to back. It's very unlikely that anybody that hears this will have time to buy tickets and go. But if you happen to be in Dallas, you can go to the Skeptics Guide homepage where we still have some tickets available for the – we almost sold out of the extravaganza, uh, which is amazing because we just – you know. COVID just killed everybody's desire or, or willingness to go out. But now it seems like things are going back to normal. And Andrew, we have two live shows because we, we basically sold out of one of them. So I split awesome. it in half. Awesome. Which is really cool. Yeah, really excited about it. So anyway, after this weekend, we have the, the uh, two Chicago shows coming up in August. So I'll give you Woo-hoo. more details about that. You can buy tickets for both of those events, though, on the Skeptics Guide homepage. So yeah, on August 17th, we'll have the extravaganza. And on August 18th, we will be recording our 1,000th episode. Whoa. Right? Oh, that's awesome. That's just, you and know. And then we're done. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Finally. Then we got to no do more it all skepticism. over again. Oh, congrats. I've been thinking about how your 1,000th episode is coming up and wondering how you were going to commemorate it. And uh, now that's you know. amazing. Yeah, by the way, I'm going to do this live on air. You ready, Andrea? I'm ready. How would you like to be a virtual guest on that show? Sure, me? Yes, yes. I would love to. You are, are you kidding? Invited. Yay. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'd be honored. We'll call you in, you know, as we usually do, like a live stream. Yeah. And then we'll we'll chit-chat with you. You could you could talk about like whatever your favorite moments, like, you know, we'll just kind of reminisce about the stuff we've done together and, you know, your appearances on the show and other things that we've done as the SGU. Oh, well, I'm going to cry. That's lovely. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, basically, I'll... you have to talk about how awesome we are. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll be there. I'll, I'll mostly talk about the time that rule. Bob insulted Steve as a podcaster during... Uh... Yes. <laughs> that was awesome that was when awesome. we did that. Yeah. You, you were with me on that one. That was not Yeah, I know. It was amazing. Um, I just insulted him as a doctor. So uh, we both have a, a cross we to tag bear, teamed him. Yeah. No, I, I would be honored. Awesome. Absolutely. That's... Um, I'm thrilled. Thank I you. got you both beat. Whenever I talk, I insult Steve's intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, couple more things. If you appreciate the work that we do on this show, you could do a few things. One, you could join our mailing list. We send out an email every week that lets people know about everything that we have created the previous week, um, which is nice because you could see all of Steve's blog posts in various places, and you'll see the podcast. You'll see the stuff that we do on TikTok and the stuff we do on YouTube. We, we're, we're pretty busy over here. Uh, another thing that you could do is you can become a patron of the show. You can go to patreon.com forward slash skeptics guide. If you appreciate the work that we do, that would be a wonderful way to show your support. And also you can give our show a rating on one, whatever podcast player you're using. I do know that iTunes is still a good place to do that because people use that to, uh, to find new podcasts. Back to you, brother. All right. Thank you, Jay. All right, guys, let's go on with science or fiction. 
It's time for science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items or facts, two real and one fake. Then I challenge my panel of skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. We have a theme this week. What is it? Do you guys want to guess what it is? I want to know. Eclipse. It's got to no. be eclipse. Oh. Nematodes. What airplanes not to fly on? <laughs> it is based on a recent holiday, Easter, Easter. which was celebrated. Halloween. Nope. <laughs> it is all about eggs. Eggs. Okay. See how okay. much you know about eggs. I know a lot about eggs. I, don't, I know almost nothing, so let's go. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Item number one. By weight, the egg white is greater than 90% protein, while the egg yolk is greater than 90% fat. All right, number two, Easter egger chickens are a breed that can lay eggs which are yellow, blue, green, cream, or even pink. And item hmm. number three, in the U.S., eggs must be refrigerated once harvested and cleaned, while in Europe, eggs are stored at room temperature. Okay. All right, Jay, you seem pretty confident about your egg knowledge. I actually am, Steve. Why don't I you am. go I first? Think I got this one. All right. All right, Steve, the first one, by weight, the egg white is 90% or you know greater than 90% protein, while the egg yolk is 90% fat. Yeah, I mean, you know, egg whites are the very low or zero fat uh, way to eat eggs without, you know, getting all that fat, right? Because that's where all the protein is, or so they've been telling me. I mean, I just think that one is science. I mean, you know, I don't know. Not, when you're saying that 90% by weight. Greater than 90%. Greater is, is protein. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. I think I agree with that. I mean, the, everything I know about eggs, that is 100% on. Um, number two, Easter egg chickens are a breed that can, can lay eggs, which are yellow, blue, green, and cream. I highly doubt that one. But let me jump to number three real quick. In the U.S., eggs must be refrigerated once harvested and cleaned. Well, in Europe, eggs are stored at room temperature. That is, um, I absolutely think that is fact. Very confident that that one is science. I do not think that we could have selectively bred or even genetically modified chickens. I don't think that we have. I think we could, but I don't think that people have done this to make them lay colored eggs for freaking Easter. No, that did not take place. That was a fiction. Okay, Bob. All right, the uh, egg white is protein. I mean, yeah. Pretty common knowledge. I don't know if it's greater than 90%. Maybe it's only 75%, but I, I don't think you're going you're gonna to do that. Um, so that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, we'll go to number three, um, refrigerated and, and not refrigerated. Yeah, th this makes sense. Although to me, having an egg not be in the refrigerator is weird and I would probably avoid it. But I think it doesn't matter that much because I mean, you're cooking the egg anyway. Any bacteria that may have a, a, a rose, you know, you, you're going to cook it anyway. So I think it's probably wouldn't last as long unrefrigerated, but I think it's fine. And that makes sense that they would do that. Uh, yeah, it's a middle one that's just killing me. I mean, colored eggs, never heard heard that before. I mean, what kind of effort would it even take to make that happen? And, and it's just so easy to color them anyway. And just for one silly holiday, you're going to do some, some genetic engineering and breeding uh, to get those eggs. It'd be cool, but I doubt that's that's worth the effort or, or even how possible that is. So that two is fiction, the colored eggs. Okay, Andrea. All right. So I'm going to go, after all that talk of uh, coordination and, and sense of belonging today, I'm going to go against Jay and Bob on this. Ah. So I'm going to start with, with number two, this, this Easter egg or chickens laying eggs that are multiple different colors. That feels to me, and I think, Steve, I always try to over-psychoanalyze you and you always beat me, so I'm probably <laughs> treading in the wrong here. I'm going to say that's science because it seems like something that's so obviously preposterous and unheard of that you wouldn't have just put it in. You, you put it in, you, you were trying to trick us because it seems so silly. And we're doing all kinds of wild things, and so why not? Uh, I'm sure there's some corner of the market where someone's making a pretty penny by selling eggs that are multiple different colors. I feel like in China, they've figured out how to do all kinds of wild things when I was living there, so I could totally see that happening. And that makes me think about number three, about eggs needing to be refrigerated once harvested in the U.S. I don't know about eggs, but generally I find when I travel that we refrigerate things a ton more than yeah. other countries, and so I, I've, I'm inclined to think that that is science. And the only other one that's giving me some pause is, is this, um, the egg white being more than 90% protein, well, the egg yolk is more than 90% fat. I'm a, The protein sounds right, but the egg yolk as fat is giving me pause. So if I were to say that that were, 
you know, I need a fiction at this point because I've decided to believe the colorful egg or chicken. So I'm going <laughs> to say... You're stretching here? Yeah. Uh, so I'm stretching. And so I'm going to say that, that the egg white being not more than 90% protein and the yolk being more than 90% fat, I'm going to say those are fiction. I think the yolk is not that much fat, even though I know it's horrible for you and I know there's cholesterol and I don't really know how those go together. I'm going to say that one's the fiction. Okay. Okay. So you all agree on number three, so we'll start there. In the U.S., eggs must be refrigerated once harvested and cleaned, while in Europe, eggs are stored at room temperature. You guys all think that one is science. Steve, can I, can I um, before you do it, can I give you the, tell you more info now? Yeah, go ahead. That's because they wash the eggs in the United States, and they don't have the protective coating that the ones in Europe do. Okay, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> uh, well, this one is, Jay, you might be surprised to find out that this one is, this is science. And you are correct, <laughs> Jay, but it's a more, way more complicated story than that. So, yes, it is mm, because, as usual. so why do we wash the eggs? That's, a, that's, a, that's one question. But let, let me just say, it's, you have to choose a strategy to minimize the introduction of, of sal- salmonella into mm. the egg, right? Yeah. So the eggshell is there to protect the egg. So you need to protect the integrity of that eggshell. In the U.S., we tend to uh, factory farm our eggs more, so they're, they're less free range, which means there's more crap on them, right? Mm-hmm. So we so we decided we're going to clean the eggs because there's more feces on them. But then when you do that, you know you have to keep it refrigerated and at a constant temperature because you don't want the eggshell to essentially allow, you know, you don't want it to get porous. You don't want it to get wet necessarily. You want to keep it cool so that the bacteria doesn't proliferate and doesn't get inside the shell. Whereas in Europe, they rather than cleaning the eggs, they try to have clean farming processes so you can harvest the egg without having to clean it. And there you can keep it at a constant room temperature, which also keeps the shell from opening up at any point and uh, allowing the bacteria in. Also, when you do f- refrigerate it, you can't then s- l- let it warm up to room temperature. Mm. You're committed to, f- to refrigerating it. Like beer. Because, yeah, because then, then the, the shell does like expand and then let, lets the bacteria in. So you got to p- pick your lane. You're either going to keep it refrigerated until you use it, or you could keep it at room temperature and it will last for a while. Because, again, the shell works, you know, it keeps mm. it protects the egg. So what does cleaning do to it, though, that necessitates refrigerating it it weakens the shell a little bit oh that's what i was missing yeah it weakens the shell a little bit it weakens yeah so in europe they keep they keep the integrity of the shell by not cleaning it but then they have to have cleaner farming practices so there's less less feces on the shells and yeah something to be said for that so i can't do the thing where i was like oh i got back from europe and now i'm cultured i'm not going to refrigerate my eggs anymore it doesn't work that way because no eggs (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. noted you got you got to follow the rules wherever you are yeah uh, let's go back to number two. Easter egg or chickens are a breed that can lay eggs which are yellow, blue, green, cream, or even pink. Jay and Bob, you think this one is the fiction. Andrew, you think it sounds too much like the fiction, so it must be me trying to <laughs> trick you. So you yeah. think this one is science. And this one is science. Here we this go. This one is science. What the hell? So right. it's actually not that big a deal to lay eggs which are different colored. Lots of birds lay colored, different colored eggs. It says zero about the contents of the egg. It's just about the compounds that get incorporated mm. into the shell. Mm. And it's all, so it's about the genetics of the breed. Um, there are a lot of chicken breeds which lay blue eggs, and they are increasing in popularity among small farms or you know people who keep chickens apparently the breeds themselves are very nice they lay lots of eggs they're very they're very easy to take care of and they happen to lay blue egg sh- blue shelled eggs which are very pretty so i wouldn't be mm. surprised if they start showing up at some point or if you know at farm farmers markets or whatever you find blue eggs so i was researching that when i was researching the chicken egg segment and then i came across this easter egg or chicken which is uh, is a hybrid, right? It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Of a blue blue egg laying <laughs> chicken with other breeds, then they got it so that they could lay all these different colors. And it's amazing. It is like Easter eggs. I mean, that's why it's called the Easter oh egg God. or chicken. They're beautiful, all the, all the different colors. 
It, but it's but here's the thing: each individual chicken lays only one color egg, uh. right? But the breed you could have mm. in, within that breed there are yellow laying chickens and blue egg laying chickens and green egg lay, laying chickens, cream and pink. Right, it's a diverse group you'd have yes. to get, get the Easter. Colors. And they're they're like they lay a lot of eggs. They're nice big eggs. They're you know the chickens are easy to manage. So there's oh no reason God. there's no reason why our eggs have to be white or cream or you know whatever that tan color you know they could yeah. be any of these colors. I like this. Yeah. All right. All this means how, that. How by, come I haven't seen any of these? I tan know. Eggs. <laughs> They're pretty. Look them up online. The Easter Egger I'm chickens. Looking at them now. By weight, the egg white is greater than ninety percent protein, while the egg yolk is greater than ninety percent fat. Is the fiction, Andrea? You are correct. While the egg white is pretty much mostly protein. Right in terms of the macronutrients, the egg yolk actually has more protein per gram than the egg white does. Ooh. Um, but there's more no there's more shit. egg white than yolk, so you get more protein from the whites only because there's more of it. Right, but mm. the egg yolk has actually more protein per gram than the more egg densely packed with white. The- wow! Does, but it also has more fat, so it, it it has almost all the fat that's in the egg is in the yolk. Right. Yeah. But it's, and it's about like, it's a little bit less than two thirds fat and one third protein, but, uh, but it's still more densely packed with protein. Hmm. Wow. Well, I don't like yeah, that. I just eat the whole damn thing. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. <laughs> eggs are like 70 calories. There's a lot of nutrients are, in them. It's actually. Eggs are awesome. I have yeah. eggs Yeah, every but day. one egg has 30% of the, cholest- the cholesterol that a person should eat. So be careful with eggs. Yeah, Did but eating eggs- cholesterol is not that big a problem. Why? Right. Exactly. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that you make more, more cholesterol in your body. So this is like a 1980s kind of myth yeah. you know, about the eating the eggs and cholesterol. Right. So now I'm learning about like I don't have to worry about how much cholesterol I eat? Is yeah, it's happening? not as much of a problem as we thought 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, a high-fat diet is worse for your cholesterol, I think, than eating a lot well, of cholesterol. Actual in cholesterol. I know that's, that, that's one of those uh, simplistic heuristics, you know, that mm-hmm. a lot of people fall into, like – how much you eat of something, you have that something in your body. It's so right. rife with the whole the, the clean eating health food guru nonsense. It's like, oh, chlorophyll's good, so eat chlorophyll. It's like, yeah, you know what happens when you eat stuff like that? You digest it. You don't have it in this, in its undigested, unbroken yeah. up form. You know, it, it, and or like, oh, you know, if you need more melatonin in your brain, you'll take melatonin. It's like, well. It's not necessarily, it doesn't translate necessarily because you're like making it in a specific part of your brain at a specific time. Just, what if I put it in my ears? Yeah, yeah right. Closer. And it's the same thing, good and bad. Like, so, you know, just because you're like, you're having, and it's also remember, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. It's real, more about the ratio. It is about the total number too, but the ratio is, 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 yeah. is also important. And this is complicated and it's protein. a moving target and the answer is always changing, but. Every time you read a study, like, actually, it's whatever. So they're constantly tweaking the recommendations and the and the evidence about this. Generally speaking, yes, you want to have your cholesterol less than two hundred. You want a good HDL to LDL ratio, and the way to do that is just keep lean, exercise, don't eat a lot of animal fat. You know, but yeah. eating cholesterol itself doesn't appear to be one of the risk factors. All right. Well, you know, this is why I make this show because I always learn something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is kind of like the 90s movement for like fat-free products. It was like any fat you would eat must be bad for you. Yeah. So we're all going to eat zero fat and we ate all this sugar instead. Um, right. Obviously, the type of fat and how much you have, yes. but it's not to say that all f- – any bit – I mean, I avoided nuts until I was 30, you know, because of this stuff. And that's so. kind of productive. Yeah. Because nuts have good fat. They're good yeah. for you. Yeah. 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 All right. Egg and that's, nut omelets coming right, right up. Exactly. I'm going to yeah. make an egg and nut omelet <laughs> tonight. Yeah. So Andrea, the, nice solo win this week. Yeah, so, uh, what the hell, well, man? Thank this you is very not much. supposed to happen. Thank you. It's all because I decided not to trust Steve. Yeah. So, uh, or Bob or so Jay. I'm confident you that I trusted all of us. Week. Yeah, that's I, true. That's I true. was so unbelievably sure that I got it all right tonight. <laughs> you were very <laughs> confident, Jay. You, I am you humbled. You did sound confident. Well, I got to tell you, you know, when I saw the Ager one, the Easter Ager, I'm like, that's my fiction. That's my fiction. <laughs> it was so good. I knew I was, that was. It so seemed like, so fake. I had the same reaction. Yeah, it seemed so fake. And it's like, how did I, now have I never heard of this before? Yeah. And why isn't, why aren't store shelves full of these eggs on, on weekends? I think it's just, there's just not many of them around. You know, they're not industrialized, but, but they are, be, apparently they're growing in popularity for like, you know, local farms. 
Okay. Check it out. Evan's not here, so I came up with a quote Okay. for hmm. this week. Here's the quote. As always in life, people want a simple answer, and it's always wrong. Ooh. That is from Susan Greenfield, who's a neurochemist who researches Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. Susan Greenfield. Yep, very nice. And I was just, just referring to this previously. People like simple answers. It's mm-hmm. one, of our, one of our core biases. Uh, but the world is complicated. So simple, compelling, satisfying answers, they're usually wrong. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We yeah. like stories so, that we can understand. Yeah, and yep. wrap our head around. Yeah, absolutely. And tweet and share. And tweet. Me. I mean, think about Twitter. Twitter is all about short, simple, you yeah. know, blurbs. Yep. Think about it. All right. Well, hey, Andrea, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks for having me. Always Thank fun you. to to, see, to hang out with you guys and safe travels. Enjoy the eclipse, everyone. Thank you. Yep. We're off to Dallas. The next episode will be one of the two shows that we record in Dallas. Should be fun. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions, dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible. 